This is the fourth and final installment of a series focusing on Linus Love battling some of the best tournament players in the world at the Triton Montenegro High Roll Series. In this final end boss scene, we'll see Linus, the number one cash player in the world, match up against Alex Foxen, the number one tournament player in the world, at least by GPI standards. So Linus opens the action by min raising in the cutoff with ace, deuce of clubs. And in my earlier videos, I used Poker Snowy to construct preflop ranges. But while Poker Snowy I think has very solid ranges, they aren't technically GTO. So I decided to look into some GTO alternatives and ended up finding a company called Range Converter, which provides various preflop ranges which have been solved using Munker Solver. Here you see a typical preflop tree, and at each position it'll give you options to raise, fold, or call. So we're going to fold all of these hands until we get to the cutoff, and then we'll open, and here is the RFI range. One really cool feature I want to highlight is that if you want to use this range in Pio, you can just copy this here and paste it here, and voila. So here is the GTO cutoff range with an ante, and we see that all of the ace-x suited holdings are opening here. And if we want to see how the ante affects this range, we can compare it to the GTO cutoff opening range for a cash game. As you can see, with an ante, we should be opening more of these big little suited cards, all these 6x suited holdings, all pocket pairs, more of the suited connectors, including some two gappers, and more of these offsuit Broadway hands. So is Jungle Man just doing his best uh, Dan Blazarian impression, I suppose? I think so, yeah. I didn't make that up, by the way. Somebody had said that on Twitter and oh, okay. made a lot of sense. After Linus is cut off open, the action folds around to Alex in the big blind, and he calls with 7-4 of diamonds. In Foxen's spot, we see that 7-4 suited is a clear call, with the solver including basically 100% of all suited cards in its calling range against a standard cutoff open. And juxtaposed against the solver's big blind range without an ante, we see that the decreased odds tighten the range quite considerably. Interestingly, with the ante, the big blind exhibits more aggression, three betting hands that do not have great post-flop playability, including some of these lower pocket pairs and unsuited holdings containing a Broadway card. Flop comes 9-6-3 with two hearts and a spade, and Alex checks, which Pio does with most of its range, as we can see here. Linus checks behind. We see here that Pio prefers betting ace deuce of clubs with greater frequency than checking, but it also checks this holding a decent percentage of the time, so Linus' play seems fine. Interestingly, Pio is betting most of its range full pot here, apparently leveraging its overall equity advantage against the big blind's wide range. Check, check on the flop. Nine high flop, two hearts out there. 22,000 in there. A pair of deuces now for Linus. Foxen has just below a starting stack. I think it's reasonable to think that he actually just bought in. 14. The turn brings a two of spades, giving Linus bottom pair, and Alex leads out with around a 64% pot bet. So Alex picks up a gut shot, and he currently has seven high. So at first glance, taking a stab here seems to make sense. However, if we look at Pio, we see that it is actually checking this holding most of the time. So why is that, and how do we determine which hands to bluff when we have such a wide range? Well, the conventional wisdom in theory is that you should construct your entire range so that you have the proper ratio of bluff and value combos, taking into account bet sizing, the street you're on, and other factors. However, in reality, this may be difficult, if not impossible to do on the fly, especially when there's a shot clock and you're dealing with a wide range. 
As an alternative, we can try to mimic Pio's overall bluffing strategy by using a range construction abstraction, which involves two steps. The first is determining who has the overall range advantage and to what degree, because this will give you a general sense of how many value hands you have, which is proportional, though not directly correlated, to the number of bluffs you can fire. Generally speaking, the range advantage will belong to the player that has a greater percentage of his range, which converges around the stronger hands available given the board. At the extreme, with a significant range advantage, Pio will advise to bet your entire range. However, in most situations, Pio will use a mixed strategy to avoid aggressively overbluffing, particularly on later streets, since generally your value to bluff ratio should increase as you move from street to street. Which leads us to the second step of the analysis finding the best bluff candidates in your range when faced with a mixed strategy. Instead of attempting to visualize and count combos for the entire range, we can simplify things by focusing on the segment of the range our holding is in. We can do this because Pio generally does not use a linear bluffing strategy. Instead, typically Pio will allocate his bluffs to different segments of its low equity holdings, as we can see here, with Pio choosing bluffs with varying degrees of frequency with its ace highs, king highs, air, and draws. To put things more concretely, we can explore this abstraction using Alex's spot as an example. So step one, overall, it appears that Alex is probably at a slight range advantage, or possibly neutral, due to this board. However, Fox is out of position, which somewhat devalues his range, so we need to be somewhat sparing with our bluffs, which is evidenced by Pio checking most of its range here. Step two, we can use the range explorer to examine which hands will be the best bluff candidates in the gudge shot segment. And just as a quick tip, if you put the range explorer on the left side of your screen and put the Pio viewer on the right side of your screen, as you go through the range, you're able to see the equities here and the strategies and EV here simultaneously, which I find to be very helpful. So first off, we're going to ignore these greenish hands, which means they have decent to good equity since they're paired and therefore aren't characterized as bluffs. So putting those aside, which gut shots are the best candidates to bluff in this spot? Well, unfortunately, there are no universal rules to identify the best bluff candidates because each spot requires a unique analysis of the context based on numerous factors. But generally speaking, one of the most common drivers of the solver's bluffing strategy are blockers. And on this double flushed board, obviously holding a spade and or a heart will have the greatest card removal effects since they decrease the probability of Linus holding a flush draw, which he would be very unlikely to fold to a single bet. Right? We see Pio betting almost all of these gut shots that have both a spade and a heart, which is contrasted to the suited versions of these holdings, which are mostly checking. I should note that Pio will be less inclined to bluff with gut shots containing an ace in the spot because they will have potential showdown value, which is usually a negative factor when determining the best bluff candidates. So taking all of that into account, given that this board is either neutral or it gives Alex a slight range advantage, but there are a number of better bluff candidates in his segment, we can reason our way to the conclusion that 7-4 of diamonds leans more towards being checked than being bet. I mean, it just, you know, you don't need a hand anymore in this game. No. Not only do you not need a hand, like, you just, it seems like they're playing lowest hand wins. So Linus calls, and Pio also calls here, which I think clearly is the standard play with bottom pair. All I keep thinking to myself is I'm folding too much. <laughs> don't try this at home, kids. Yeah, this is wild. <laughs> So we get to the river with bottom pair versus seven high. <laughs> Last hand was 10 high versus queen high. It's hard to make a hand. I have to imagine that Foxen wasn't bluffing the turn to give up on the river with seven high. The only reason he would is if he does not like the actual river card. 
the river brings, the eight of spades, and Alex bet small, around 38% pot. At first glance, this sizing may seem surprising. Since Alex bet 64% on the turn, one may think that a larger sizing would be warranted on the river to fold out a greater percentage of Linus's range. However, we see that Pio agrees with this bet and this sizing, which again, may be a function of Alex's range. Since his range is so wide and he has so many potential missed draws on his board, Linus should be calling wide here as well, so it becomes more risky to start wagering larger and larger bets. Right, we see that Pio is actually choosing the smaller sizing for most of its range when betting on the river. However, we note that since Alex will want to build a larger pot with some of his stronger hands, such as some of these flushes, we should also include some bluffs in his range that also bet a larger sizing. And to determine which bluff candidates should utilize the larger sizing, we can again use the second step in our abstraction by finding the best bluff candidates at the bottom of Alex's range. But since we are now on the river, we analyze all of our missed draws and our air in one segment. In this particular spot, the eight of spades brings in both flushes and straights. So it makes sense that the best bluff candidates to bet larger with here would be hands containing flush and or straight blockers. And as you can see, the only bluff combos Pio is overbetting with are these holdings that have both a spade and a straight blocker, which really highlights how important the blockers can be from a GTO perspective. Not a huge bet, but Linus only with a bluff catcher. It makes the call. In the face of Alex's relatively small bet, Linus calls, which again I think is the standard play here. I'm not quite sure what the eye roll is about, but it seems that both players played pretty optimally here, and I don't think Alex made this bet thinking Linus would fold a pair. Right, if Alex bet larger, even up to full pot, we see that Pio advises a call with ace-deuce most of the time. And although his bluff attempt failed, the solver is clearly telling us that these smaller bluffs should be used. Right, every bluff doesn't need to be huge and fold out a significant chunk of your opponent's range. Opening the cutoff means that Linus' range will be relatively wide, so he should have a number of missed draws and some ace highs that Alex can fold out with a smaller bet, which would be a significant win for 7 high. However, bluffing very large in this spot without strong blockers can potentially be a recipe for disaster, since Linus' calling range with made hands is relatively inelastic, due in part to Alex's wide range and the wet board. So some may view this hand as mundane, but in my opinion, these hands where one player has a marginal holding and the other player has an extremely wide range are very difficult to manage, but come up quite often so they warrant attention. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. In the spirit of WSOP season, I'm going to try to include some bracelet tournament reviews soon, so perhaps we may actually get to see some players that don't play quite as optimally as these guys, which should be interesting. So until next time, stay balanced.